the Lord brought some talented people to our church family to help us uh, in worship. I appreciate them. If you have your bulletins, I invite you to turn there and, and uh, to the center and follow along with the outline of today's message. Um, when, when my son Caleb was in elementary school, they were having a show and tell day uh, one day, and the teacher told him to bring something to, to class the next day that would teach the class something about their faith. And um, so uh, the show and tell day came, and, and the first little girl stood up in front of the class, and she said, my name's Sally. And, I'm Catholic, and these are my rosary beads. And the kids passed them around while she talked to the class about what it meant to be a Catholic. And when she finished, the next little boy stood, and he said, My name's Benjamin, and, and I'm Jewish, and this is my prayer shawl. And, and they passed that around the room while he talked to them about uh, what it meant to be Jewish. And uh, the next little girl stood up and said, My name's Mia, and I'm, I'm a Buddhist, and this is my statue of the Buddha. And, and while they passed that around, she talked to him about Buddhism. Well, finally, Caleb's turn came, and he stood up and said, My name's Caleb. I go to the Carpenter's Christian Church, and this is a bucket of Lee's chicken. And pass that around while I'll explain what we do um, around here. I think, that, let me be clear, that's a joke. And my son is now mortified and will not speak to me for the remainder of the day. That, that's not a true story. Um, when I say that I'm preaching on, on fellowship, though, I bet you that's what a lot of you think about uh, when we say fellowship, if we say we're going to have fellowship today, you're like, when is the meal? You know, we are ready to, to have the potluck, and we think of potlucks and ice cream socials maybe um, after an evening concert or something like that. When we say fellowship, we just think there's some food getting ready to happen. And sometimes food can be a big part of the fellowship we enjoy. But today, my goal is that you'll understand that as we conclude this series on the purposes of the church, that fellowship is an important part of that. And it's much more than just meals or potlucks or ice cream socials. Uh, but some might say, Greg, I'm with you on the first ones, evangelism and discipleship and, and worship and service. Those are all biblical things that the church should be about. But fellowship, that's kind of our guilty pleasure, isn't it? That's just this thing that we like to do, but really we ought to be doing some holy stuff and some other things. But uh, to say that it's a purpose of the church, I don't know. But I would tell you today that, in fact, I would contend that, that true fellowship is a powerful and vital part of a healthy church. And I want to show you from scriptures why uh, I believe that. If you have your Bible with you today, I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to start with verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And there in verse 41, we pick up right after Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, man, he did his thing and, and he pierced the hearts of those who heard that message that day and many responded. And in verse 41 it says, So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That would be a pretty good day. I mean, if we ever had 3,000 saved here, uh, yeah, I, I would be excited, to say the least. And can you imagine, that's a pretty good way to, to start a church and to plant a church with 3,000 people coming to Christ. But I also imagine that uh, a number of people like that, uh, that big of a crowd, would likely propose a, a challenge to manage and disciple all those folks. And you might imagine that you could easily see a scenario where some out of 3,000 plus would feel neglected or maybe just feel lost in the crowd at some point. But as we read on, what I'm amazed at is that doesn't seem to be the case. As we read on through the book of Acts as it gives the account of the early church, um, we find out in verse 42 it says, uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Uh, many of the same things that we are still devoted to today. And we're trying to preserve those foundational things that the church ought to be about. Uh, the apostles were teaching them from the Word, much like we're doing right now. Uh, they broke bread. Now, sometimes uh, the term breaking of bread was, was talking about a meal. And they would literally have a meal. I don't know if it was potluck or how they rolled back then. But, but they would sometimes just sit down and enjoy a meal together. But in other times, that phrase, breaking of bread seems to indicate that they were partaking of communion together. And I won't 
go into all the details as to why, but it's believed by many Bible scholars that, that generally they're talking about communion here. They would meet together for communion. They spent time together in prayer. And there seems to be, though, out of those foundational things, there was a common fabric woven through all of them of fellowship. Verse 42 says it wasn't just something they did and felt like they ought to be busy doing something else, but it says they were devoted to fellowship. As you read through this passage, note the recurring notion that they did all of these things together, and they did them on a regular basis. Verse 44 says, and all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. It was a, a communal experience, if you will. The passage goes on to describe how they were worshiping together. They were praying together, eating together, sharing their money and their resources with one another as they had need. And as I read this account, I just don't get the idea that they had to beg or use gimmicks to coerce people to come and, and, and be a part of the church. I think that people were drawn to this thing. One, because of the Holy Spirit. But two, they wanted to be a part of a fellowship like that. You know, this fellowship seems to have been so strong that I get the feeling that the time that they spent together was the highlight of their week. Uh, they enjoyed, and I just imagine they lingered afterwards not wanting to leave that sweet fellowship that they enjoyed with other believers in Jesus Christ. You know, when fellowship is strong like that, it has a tendency to draw people, doesn't it? Like a moth to a light. When fellowship is strong, and the love is great among people, it draws people. Verses 47 and 48 says that they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. No wonder. The Holy Spirit was doing what only the Holy Spirit can do, but there was an incredible fellowship among those believers in that early church. Don't misunderstand me today. People are saved by the Word of God. And they're saved by the Holy Spirit drawing them to salvation. But the strong fellowship, that it, if it's right, it creates fertile soil for the Holy Spirit to do its thing. It draws people in to hear this message and to respond in faith. Listen, I believe that we have a basic human need to connect with others. All the way back in the book of Genesis... God noted this in, in Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I find it interesting today that even in our prison system, uh, when they need to punish, you know, they're already being punished by being in prison, but when they need to give out punishment within the prison system, they'll place them in solitary confinement. And even a hardened criminal, uh, someone that you would think was tough and really you could say, well, they don't need anybody. It, it, it's seen as a huge punishment to be totally withdrawn from fellowship with everyone. In his book entitled Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect, UCLA professor Matthew Lieberman writes this, A growing body of research shows that we need to connect socially with others. It's as basic as our need for food, water, and shelter. You know, some people, desperate for connections with others, have a tendency to look for it in all the wrong places. I see young people in particular who sometimes that they're raised right, they were taught right and wrong, and, and it was ingrained in them, but um, they're willing to set aside their moral standards because they so desperately want to connect. And we both know today, well, that's not just young people, don't we? We know that as adults, sometimes we're willing to do the same thing. People flock to bars and dance clubs hoping to connect with someone, anyone, and they're willing to set aside things that they hold dear as part of their convictions just to make those connections. You know, knowing how people desperately want to connect with others, it makes me wonder this. What would happen if the church could become the easiest place in town to find that kind of acceptance? What if the church was the easiest place in town to make a true connection with other people. Now, the, the ultimate connection that each one of us needs, you and I both know, we need to connect with Jesus Christ, and that needs to be understood. But one of the most effective ways that we can get people to that relationship with Jesus Christ they need is if they can connect with us. If they can be accepted and find that they have value with us, 
And then we can point them to the one that gives all acceptance and value. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, I pray that the Carpenters Christian Church is always a church where it's the easiest place in town for people to come in and find acceptance. And I know that we're, we're bound to fall short of that sometimes. Someone comes in and we just, we're distracted and we don't convey that the way that we should. We're doing all that we can to be intentional about that. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment. But let's commit ourselves to making this church family one of the easiest places to go and find acceptance. Because I believe then we say in the fellowship that we enjoy, it's with God the Father. It's the right kind of fellowship. Um, you know, I've talked in recent weeks about what we're doing as a church to be intentional about welcoming people who visit uh, our church. And John oversees one of the church's most important ministries in our connection team. And I so appreciate John and his work with that, but also the work of the, the kingdom workers who work and serve out in our parking lot. Uh, you might think, well, that's not important. Yes, it's vitally important. Uh, those that work as our inside greeters, chair captains, kids' church sign-in, and those that man the connection counter, and I'm probably leaving somebody out. Forgive me if I am, but we're always looking for more people to serve. So if you're interested in being a part of, of one of those welcoming ministries, uh, just see, see John or myself, and we'd love to get you plugged in uh, in one of those ways. But we never want anyone who attends here to leave saying, I just didn't feel like I could fit there didn't feel like there was a place for me that maybe I'm just not important to them. But you know, I want to talk to you about a second point today, that after you've attended here for several weeks, several months, there's another level that I encourage you to move toward, another step to take in, in your level of fellowship as you seek to be rooted in Christ. After a while, friendly handshakes can, the, the importance of those can wane a little bit. And after a while, the Sunday morning kind of talking about the weather and last night's game and those, we need a little bit more than that, don't we? We need to move to another level of fellowship that I think is vitally important in your relationship with the church. I've been preaching for almost 15 years now, and I've seen it time and time again that people will come into the church and maybe we do a good job of making them feel welcome and accepted in a place that they belong. And they, they settle into a Sunday morning routine and, and they feel good about that for a while. But they never move to this next step that I want to talk to you about today. This deeper connection in fellowship that I want to talk with you about. And eventually, they drift away from the church. It happens more often than I would care to admit. And so that's why I'm talking about this today is any influence I might have with you, I encourage you to take this next step if you've been here for a while and consider digging in and, and not being like the soil that Jesus talked about where it quickly sprang up and started to do great things, but then it didn't have roots and it withered and it drifted away. I don't want that for you. This next level of fellowship that I'm talking about uh, can, can happen in different ways, but I think it happens maybe best in a small group. I believe the early church met together in small groups. Uh, some of you may wonder where I'm getting that. I don't know that they called them small groups, and they said, hey, this Wednesday night we're having small groups. You know, come out to our... I think it just happened naturally. And I think that's where this type of fellowship that we read about in Acts chapter 2 that stuff probably happened in the context of these smaller groups. Look at verse 46 of Acts 2. And day by day, attending the temple together, that was their large group setting like we're in now. That's important. But then it says, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. It's not talking about everybody going back to the house and eating individually. They were together in homes outside of the, the Sunday morning gathering. And notice that this verse makes a distinction between what they did in the temple and what went on individually in their homes, in their small gatherings. 
uh, when they got together in those smaller groups, they were able to enjoy deeper levels of connection and fellowship with one another. That's where they shared meals. I believe that's likely where they shared possessions and helped people out as they became aware of needs and enjoyed one another's company. I doubt that all 3,000 of them ate together in one home. It's not really realistic to think that we're going to experience that kind of fellowship only on Sunday mornings and say that we'd be willing to, to give from our bank account to help somebody else that we barely know. But in these connections, uh, it happens quite naturally. So I want to wrap up today by talking about why is this deeper fellowship of a small group so important? What's so special about it? Well, first of all, relationships have a powerful effect on who we become. Uh, you've likely heard me say it from this pulpit before when talking about the negative side of this, that if you run with the wrong crowd, uh, don't be surprised if a, a radical change doesn't start to happen just very over time in you and you become a person you may not recognize. There's a saying that if you lay down with the dogs, you're going to what? You're going to get fleas. And so we, we talk about that negatively. If you start running with the wrong crowd, some bad things can happen and you'll just start changing. But listen, what about the positive side of that? What if you purposely and intentionally run with the right crowd and run with people who are on the right track in life and, and headed in the right destination? It can be an awesome thing. And, and, and one of the ways that we are equipped here in the church is in our small groups, we try to put together communities of people who are running the same way in life toward the same goals and, and trying to serve the same Savior. Simply put, when we develop friendships with other committed Christians, we tend to, to have, have an effect on one another. Listen to Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. See, I enjoy being around you guys. Because I just tell you, sometimes out there in, in the culture that we talked about today before we sang We Believe, in that culture that's getting darker all the time, I, I get discouraged sometimes. And I tend to feel like, I know better, but I tend to feel sometimes like I'm the only one trying to live for Jesus, you know? And I know I've got hang-ups, and I just, I need some encouragement to know, to know that somebody else is on this journey with me. And sometimes you can start to think uh, some crazy thoughts, and I need to get with people that are also grounded in the Word and say, now this is what we believe, right? And, and you're normal and I'm normal, we're good, right? And we encourage each other that we're on this, this race. Iron sharpens iron. And, and even if it's something that you've heard many times before, it's important to go over it again, bring it to the forefront of our minds, discuss it, and share our commitment to it together. We learn from the wisdom of others, from the perspectives of others as we discuss things about life and the Bible. We also just learn by just being around people uh, that, are, that are living a good life, to live in a good Christian walk. You know, as I think about my life, I'm sure that I, I caught more than I was taught. Uh, by that I mean, I don't know how many formal lessons, you know, I remember, but I caught so many things by watching godly men and women live out their lives. And, and uh, I'm sure that my parents taught me things over the years, kind of formally, you know, Greg wants you to learn this. But I learned so much by watching them and their, the way that they love the church and their commitment to the church and, and, and being involved. And I don't think it's coincidence that I'm here today because of those lessons. And, and I'm watching them today in their uh, marriage, getting ready to come up and celebrate 50 years of, of marriage. And over those years, I've watched uh, how they love each other through the ups and downs of life. And, and when it gets tough, how they roll up their sleeves and they, they serve one another. And uh, it, it's, it's definitely, I'm still catching things from them today as I learn from them. But there's a value in coming together, even on Sunday mornings like we do. Listen, we live in a culture that says, that you can be spiritual, but you don't have to go to church. And I'm not interested in debating that theologically, but here's what I know. I need to be here. I need to be here and have your faith ignite my faith and keep it stirred up. And, and I need us to, I can sit home and sing we believe by myself, but it's something else when we all come together in here and we all say that we believe these things. I need to be here around you people. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another. That's what we're, we're doing here in addition to our worship and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, a second reason I think moving to this next level of fellowship and getting involved with a smaller community of people is you want to go where everybody knows your name. Does that sound familiar? Um, maybe you remember that as the theme song to that old show, Cheers. Now, I'm not here to celebrate everything that show was about, but I do kind of like the theme song, and, and I do think there's some truth in that message that we do at the end of the day. We just want to... We want to be somewhere where everybody knows our name and we know everybody. And let's be real. As we look around this morning, I bet there's a lot of people here you don't know. And uh, there's some people here I don't know. Uh, but you know what? That's okay. And I am glad, so glad to be a part of a church where we see new faces all the time. Praise God for that. Can we thank the Lord that we see new faces all the time? And, and uh, I'm thankful for that. And so let's get over on Sunday mornings. There might be a lot of people that, that you don't know, and, and I hope that it's always that way. Uh, but we all love to also walk into a room where we know everybody, and they know us. You know, and on that old show, they, uh, there was one of them walk in, they would all holler at his name, Norm, every time he would walk in. And, and there was just something comforting about hearing your name when you walk into a room that they know you. And not only do they know you, but they know if, if you're married, they know your spouse. And if you've got kids, they know your kids, and they know their names. And, and they know about that big decision that you're weighing, uh, that you're mulling over in your mind. And they're, they're praying with you about this decision you've got to make. And they know your hang-ups, and they know the things that you're working through. And, and we, we, let our, we take our masks off, and we let people see that we don't have it all together. And you know what I found? That's encouraging when we can do that. Because if we sit on a Sunday morning and we look around, we just make assumptions. Well, she's got it all together. He's got it all together. I'm a big loser. And I found it therapeutic to get into smaller communities where we take our masks off and we say, here's kind of one of my fears. Here's one of my concerns. Or I don't know about this. And then all of a sudden we say, you know what? There's hope for me too. Uh, and we draw that encouragement from one another. We all want to go where we feel accepted. We all want to go where we feel valued by others. We want to be a part of a group where people notice if we're not there. And they miss us. And let's just be honest, you might drift away from this large setting for two or three weeks before somebody figures out you're not here. And, and I'm sorry, I wish we could say that never happens, but it does. But in a small group of 12 to 16 people, where everybody knows everybody by name, that doesn't often happen. We want to be a part where it's awesome when people call on you and check on you and say, where you been? Just want to make sure you're all right. Thirdly, small groups are great for meeting individual needs. And I want to say this today, that, that John Kessel is amazing to me when it, it comes to staying on top of what's going on with folks who are in the hospital, folks who are having surgeries, going through a crisis. He's got this... Uh, board back there in his office and it just it's got stuff written all over it but it all makes sense to him he'll show me the board and I'll go yeah that's a lot of stuff and I don't know why it doesn't mean anything to me but it, he's, it makes all this sense in his head and he's got it and and Deborah is 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 a tremendous part of his ministry and I'm just wondering if we could just give them a hand today to show them how much we appreciate that uh, you know what it seems like sometimes he's everywhere and and but even with John and Deborah it's still not possible for them to keep up with every need in a church this size and and it's very possible though for small group leaders to keep up with a congregation of 12 to 16 people and to know what's going on in their lives and to be able to to respond in a personal way when needed I love it when I go to a hospital or a funeral home and there are already a number of people from that, that family small group that are there. I think of small groups, if this is our extended family, we sing the family of God, I think of our small group as our immediate family. And they're often the first to respond. And, and uh, they stick together and they support one another in times of need. Galatians 6.2 says this, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I think it's in those smaller settings where, man, that happens most uh, commonly and effectively. 
And last of all, small groups are a great environment for learning and growing. I, I definitely think there's value in preaching or I wouldn't be a preacher. Uh, I think there's a value when we open the Word in our large group setting and we're all focused with one mindset upon that Word and letting the Spirit work among us as we focus on that Word. Uh, but small groups provide another setting that I also think is vital where you can dialogue with other people and you can ask questions. You know, uh, in this setting, we're kind of, we go about this deep, but in small groups, you can often go this deep. And it's more interactive. It's more social. And I know some of you all, you want to ask a question right now. And you want to talk with somebody about something that's been said right now. And in small groups, you have an opportunity to do that. For the past several weeks, my small group has been experimenting with what we call sermon-based group discussions. And after hearing the message on Sunday, our, our group members can read the scriptures. If you're looking at your outline on the right side of your page, on the left side over there, I usually put uh, some key scriptures that are related to the message and then some questions with each. And I went ahead and put them in there this week, even though my group won't be meeting on Wednesday, but just so you can see how that works. And then we get together on Wednesdays, and they have a chance then to read those scriptures after they hear the message and spend some time studying that word, but also giving some thought to those questions. And then when we come together, we, we center our discussion around those. And I, I've enjoyed it, and, uh, and I know that it's, it's good to dig in and go deeper. In the fall, I'm encouraging, not requiring, but encouraging our other small groups to consider moving to this approach. And the idea is that I'll introduce the topic on Sunday morning, and again, you dig into the Word after and study it on your own, uh, and look at those questions, and then we come together and have a chance to ask questions and, and dialogue with one another about it. 2 Timothy 2, 2 talks about how things work best. It says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And I think it's important that as our church continues to grow, we find ways to also get smaller and more individualized and more specific. And so I invite you into the deeper fellowship of this church so that you don't become one of those that drifts away at some point in your commitment. I'm excited about this fall, and then, uh, some of our small groups are going to be taking a break for the summer. I do think that's, that's uh, important. Some, some groups choose to meet right on through the summer, and we leave it up to each group so they can do what they want. But this fall, when we start back in August, I'm excited. Uh, the first Wednesday, we're going to have a kickoff and, and let everybody know about our small group offerings and how you can get involved in one of these. I hope that you'll be in prayer over the next couple of months about getting involved in these smaller families within the family and being a part of that. We're going to be kicking off some brand new small groups that I'm excited about. And as we get all the details worked out, we'll be telling you more about that in the, the weeks to come over the, the summer. And, but I hope that you'll be a part of that uh, this fall as well. Would you pray with me as I close today? God, I thank you uh, for the church. Uh, Lord, it would, have, it would have been great if, if you just saved us. But, Lord, you also gave us the church because you knew it wasn't good for us to do this thing alone. We, we need each other. We need encouragement uh, when this world gets tough. We need support when life hits us hard. Uh, we need an opportunity to use the gifts you've given us to go out and bless others. And uh, I thank you for the context of the church for expressing and utilizing those gifts. God, this is a tremendous church family that I'm so proud of to be a part of. Thank you for all that are serving and offering their gifts. But Lord, more than anything, I just thank you for the love that you can find in this church family. May that always be how we're known in this community, Lord, as people that love you and people that love each other and welcome whoever comes to be a part of this fellowship. And I pray that this will truly become the easiest place in town to connect with others and to connect with you. And Father, we love you. If there's anyone here today that, that doesn't have that connection with Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for them. We ask it in Jesus' name.